Okay, so today we come to uh, what? look at Revelation chapters 10 and 11. Remember, we've looked at the seven seals and we've looked at the uh, sealing of the 144,000 and the great multitude of their converts. And then we uh, looked last week at the six, first, six of the seven trumpet judgments. And then there's a delay again before we come to the seventh trumpet judgment. And that consists of chapters 10, 11, and uh, 12. So I'd like to look at chapters 10 and 11 today. In chapter 10, um, John sees a, a great angel, a mighty angel, come down from heaven, and he has a little book in his hand, and he puts his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now that's rather interesting in relation to Israel. Uh, so I think that he's a north part of Israel facing south, and he uh, cries with a loud voice. And it doesn't say what he cries, but what he So cries. it said his right foot on the sea? Right foot on yeah. the sea, left foot on the That would be the Mediterranean Sea. Yes, that's and right. Facing and south, facing south. Facing south, yes. And uh, when he cries, seven thunders utter their voices. Now, thunders always uh, are symbolic of storm in the indicative of, of storm coming, a terrible storm of judgment and wrath. And these seven thunder, thunders utter their voices and, and John, the revelator here, is uh, about to write what they said and God says to him, no, or the angel says to him, sorry, don't write uh, what you heard in the seven thunders, seal that up. Rather interesting. Yeah. And Daniel had to seal something up too. Exactly, yes. In the last chapter of Daniel, uh, Daniel uh, was given a revelation uh, of things to come. And God said, don't don't reveal that now. That's to be kept for later times. And didn't Paul say he had um, some, some things, things in his vision that he was not permitted to uh, um, to, write, yeah. to write or pass on to other people? That's right. And yeah. you know, I don't know if it was Sid Roth or someone else one day had a had a boy on there that when he was either four or five, he had the same type of experience. Yeah. And there was a few things he was told not to go of him. Uh, not to pass on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you saw that episode or anything. No, I didn't see that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. That. Yes, that was yeah. extremely interesting. Yes, <laughs> and so rather interesting. And then uh, it's rather interesting too that after this, uh, this angel that had the little book in his hand and uh, caused the seven thunders to utter their voices and those things were sealed up. And there are no other things about Revelation. As many of them are quite mysterious to us yet, quite puzzling. I think we've got the broad outline. I think I have a fair handle on that in a number of ways. But uh, there, there are things that God has reserved for himself until the time comes when he wants to reveal it. And that's an interesting point. And besides, it. some things wouldn't have been understood and it would have been weirder than the imagery. That's if they right. tried to describe a helicopter, well, they did in a sense, but if they, yes. if, you know, if they called it a helicopter... Yeah, who would know what it meant? Who would know what it meant? Yeah, they yeah. were like locusts like scorpions and... Yeah. yeah, but they seem to describe the helicopters, yeah, in the, the uh, seventh, uh, sixth trumpet judgment, yeah. And then, uh, the fifth, but... Um, Rather interesting here, it says that the angel then uh, said that that time would be no longer. He swore by him that created everything in the heavens and the earth and the, all that are in the seas, all that are in them. So here we have another direct contradiction of the of the theory of evolution. Yes. God is the creator and by the creator he swore. That there's, the King James says that there should be time no longer. And many people have said, well, that's the end of time. But, but you, all kinds of time periods mentioned, yeah. the three and a half years, the 1260 days we're coming to, the time and times and half a time and the 42 months. It means that there would be de delay no longer, but that at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the, the judgments of God are going to be finished. And, and the, the, the mystery... That's that, something like uh, we would say, time's up. That's right. But time, that's, time is up. Because that's that's what we would often say. Exactly. Somebody writing an exam. Time is up. That's our idiom now, yes. And that's exactly what it means, that there would be delay no longer. At the t sounding of the seventh trumpet, 
they're a delay no longer, but the judgments of God and the mystery of God, those truths that were hidden and are now revealed, would come to pass. So this would be an end of the judgments of God when the seventh trumpet sounded. And I used to be very puzzled by this because how could this be at the seventh trumpet when there's still seven vials or bowls of the wrath of God to come? But remember what I was saying before in connection with the seven seals, the seven trumpet judgments, and the seven vials or bowls of the wrath of God? That they're, they're like a Roman candle. We see it today that you, you know sometimes you see in, in fireworks a, a Roman candle be fired and there'll be seven balls of fire, maybe with different colors go up. And then out of the seventh one, Burst another oh, seven, you see? Oh, wow. And yeah, then out of the seventh one of those bursts another seven. It's a good example. So out of the seventh seal judgment burst the seven trumpet judgments. And out of the seventh trumpet judgment burst the seven vials or bowls of the wrath of God. So you see, the seventh trumpet contains the very end. So that will be the end. That will be the end of the judgments of God. And then it's rather interesting. The angel says, now take this little book. He has a little book in his hand and eat it up. And he says, when you eat it, it'll be sweet, taste sweet in your mouth, but in your tummy, it will, be, your stomach, it will be bitter. Now, and doesn't, isn't it more often that food reacts the opposite? Uh, you you get a you get a bitter taste uh, um, uh, in your mouth. No, what did he say? Uh, yeah, sweet? that's right. Sweet taste in your mouth, yeah, bitter but taste in your stomach. Often, uh, uh, oh yes, uh, upset food. That's right. That's yeah. right. It can upset your stomach. Okay, yeah. food can do that. So, so here he does that, and what does this mean? He says, "Well, the angel says to him, look at there are things coming, and you're going to prophesy before kings and for, before ordinary people and all kinds of people of the earth, and the judgments, of course." With the, what would be sweet about the judgments would be that the victory is going to be the Lord's. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's going to destroy all the enemies of the Lord. That's a sweet thing. But the bitter thing is the terrible judgments that are going to come up upon mankind. So that's the end of chapter 10. When we come to chapter 11, we're introduced to some amazing things. And I have suggested to you that the first half of the seven-year tribulation period, the first three and a half years, contains the judgments of the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. So we come to the end of the trumpet judgment, the seventh trumpet judgment now, and it's interesting that here's where we begin to hear about these three and a half years, 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 in different ways. And you remember, this takes us back to the book of Daniel, where we read that in the middle of the week, the middle of the seventh year period, that the Antichrist person is going to, to the person who rules the whole world at that time, is going to cause the sacrifices and the oblations in the temple of God to cease. Uh, now, many people say he's breaking the covenant, the seven-year covenant of defense that he makes with Israel, but the scripture doesn't say that. If, if you read about 99% of the commentators and hear the preachers on the TV and so on, they'll be saying he breaks the covenant, he breaks the covenant. It doesn't say he breaks the covenant. It's, it simply changes things within the covenant. But the covenant of defense with Israel continues to the end of the seven years. But here's what, a very interesting thing. We start to hear about this last three and a half years. And notice what it says about the the first thing it says about the three and a half years. John, the author of the Revelation, right in the Revelation, the Apostle John says here, and there was given unto me a reed, like unto a rod, that would be 10 feet long, one of the reeds from the uh, uh, Middle East area, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now this takes us right back to the gospel. So Lord Jesus in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 said that the, the temple would be, would, uh, the uh, temple would be kept, but Jerusalem would be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. The times the Gentiles take us through the whole four world empires that Daniel spoke about, 
the, the, at this time the Babylonian Empire, then the Medo-Persian Medo Empire, the Grecian Empire, and the Roman Empire. And of course, the revived Roman Empire is coming here. And he says the, the temple will, will be preserved, and, but Jerusalem will be trodden down to the Gentiles until the time for the Gentiles are fulfilled. That's the end of the seven years. So here, God is going to keep this temple and the worshipers therein for the last three and a half years, but separate from the rest of outside the temple. The first time I went to Jerusalem, I remember being on the Temple Mount and being able to enter into the uh, Silver Dome Mosque on the Temple Mount to the south, and then the Golden Dome, that one that's so typical of Jerusalem, you see in the news all the time, the Dome of the Rock or the Mosque of Omar. And, uh, that is there, and the big question is, how can there be a temple of God at the same time as this Muslim temple? Because so, they'll never join. No, but I believe here that we have a picture of what's going to happen. And it, we're beginning to see that it could happen. Right now, no Jew is allowed to, to enter the, the Temple Mount. Now, about 35 years ago, when I was first in Jerusalem, we, we were able to enter in. But about, uh, what was it, about 15 years ago, there was a war, the Intifada, and the, 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 the Temple Mount now is, the, the, the Jews are not allowed onto it. They can go all around it and they can dig up the Western Wall and so but they can't enter it. But there's going to be, the Bible says, there's going to be a temple, an Antichrist temple. And remember that the Antichrist is going to set himself up as God in that temple stating that he is God and demanding worship as God, Paul says in Thessalonians chapter 2. And that temple here is going to be preserved, but outside of it, outside of the temple, even in the court and the rest of the temple mount, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, are going to have the control, they're going to have the rule. This is still the time of the Gentiles, till the end of the Great Tribulation. You know, it would almost look the opposite with that uh, mosque there at the moment. But, That's right. You know, but God deals in opposite so often. So what's going to happen, I believe, and I, I think this is, makes sense out of this, it's very puzzling, but I believe that the Mosque of Omar, this golden temple of the Muslims, their third most holy place on earth, is going to continue to exist there, and I believe the, re the reconstructed temple is going to be on the mount as well, you see? Beside it? That's right, because right beside it, yeah. That's why it talks about the Gentiles and the outer court or something. That's right, yeah, and the city of Jerusalem. Very interesting, this, so that's going to continue, and notice how long it's going to continue. He said it's going to continue 40 and two months. So that's three and a half years. Now that's hard to believe, but you see, you can see things moving towards that very quickly right now. Even when Stephen Harper now, I, yep. I think he's coming back from Jerusalem today probably. Uh, he's just been in Jerusalem. And uh, you see, there are, he and his minister John Baird, the minister of foreign affairs, and President Barack Obama, and the, the uh, uh, NATO and all of the nations are saying, oh, divide the land and give some to the Palestines, try and get peace this way, give some of the land of Israel to the Palestines and keep some for, for Israel, for the Jews. You see, that's what's happened here. There's the temple and the worshippers are in there preserved, but the outside is given to the Gentiles, outside the temple itself for 42 months, three and a half years. Now we've never heard about any, <coughs> for the seven seal judgments, the seven trumpets, we haven't heard of any time periods up till now. But now we're starting to hear about three and a half years, 42 months. And then, that, then another very interesting thing happens. God, you remember, has sealed 144,000 special Jewish people to be witnesses to him, and multitudes of people have been converted to Christ through them during this, uh, tribulation period so far, but now God gives two witnesses. Now this is one of the most mysterious sections yep. of the book of Revelation, yep. the two witnesses. <clears throat> These two witnesses are amazing people. God raises them up just as he raised up the 144,000. Now he raises up two witnesses. And these witnesses, nobody can kill them. Here is the, the Antichrist person who obviously, according to chapter 13, they're coming to it. 
controls the whole earth, but he cannot kill these two witnesses. And they have power. They have power to cause from God, the, from God to stop the rain, the power to turn the waters to blood, the power to do marvelous, miraculous things. And nobody can kill them for three and a half years. Quite amazing. And there's been great speculation about who these are. Great speculation. Great speculation, yeah. Many people say, well, they have to be Moses and Elijah, come back to life. Because they didn't uh, actually... Uh Oh yes, Moses died. Moses died, but nobody knows where he's buried. That's correct. Well, there's great and some mentions Enoch because he he didn't die. That's right. Could be uh, Enoch and, uh, and Elijah, because neither of those died. And the scripture says it is appointed unto men once to die. So could it be Moses and uh, could it be Enoch and Elijah, the two that didn't die. Could it be Moses and Elijah? The miracles are the same, practically as as the miracles of Moses and Elijah. But nobody knows who these two are. But they were given this tremendous power and they witnessed for Christ, for the true God and for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says for 1260 days. Now, how long is 1260 days? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. 42 months. Guess. Three and a half years. The Daniel says the middle of the week. It's at the middle of the week that this will occur, that the Antichrist will set himself up as God in the temple of God. He, Demanding worship as God, you see, and uh, up until this point, he has allowed the Jewish people to carry on their sacrifices in the temple and their oblations and to worship their God, and that's happening now. That the, the parts, of the materials for the temple are being assembled in in Israel, in Jerusalem. People are being trained to do the mosaic ritual as it was in the days of the Lord Jesus and way back in Solomon's day. Uh, 960 years before Christ. This is all being prepared. And so for, for this three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months, later on we're going to see it's called time and times and half a time. That's one and dual two and a half, three and a half years, 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 three and a half years. Three and a half years. This Great Tribulation is going to carry on. And it's rather interesting. At the end of the three and a half years, the beast out of the bottomless pit is allowed, or the Antichrist Empire that is, is allowed to, to kill these two witnesses. Very interesting and very mysterious. These three witnesses, everybody is so, so glad that they're dead because, you see, they kept, they kept, uh, bothering people, convicting them of their sin, of their worship of this false Messiah, this Antichrist person who set himself up in the temple of God, claiming he's God, demanding worship as God. And so they, they are so happy that they make a Christmas out of it. They give gifts one to another and they rejoice because of these three witnesses they are dead now. And they cause their bodies to lie in the streets. They won't allow them to be buried. They want everybody to know they're dead. They're finally dead. And then at the end of three days, it's interesting, the Lord Jesus was in the tomb three days. Jonah was in the whale of the belly for three days. You mean belly of the whale. The whale of the belly, the belly of the whale, the belly of the belly. Yeah. Did I say that? Yeah. I can tell you a story about that. Yes, don't. And after three days and a half. Three days and a half, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, three days and a half. Yeah. Was it? Verse 11, he said. Yeah, typical of the three and a half years, I guess. Yeah, and and then the these these two witnesses are raptured. They're, they're they're resurrected and they're given life and they're caught up to heaven. And then some amazing things happen. <clears throat> it says in verse thirteen, in the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. Tenth part of the city and. In the earthquake, there were also slain 7,000 men, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And then we get the, the opening of the seventh trumpet uh, judgment, and the, the, the horror of the seventh trumpet judgment is just incredible. Uh, so we'll be coming to that after we finish this parenthetical section in chapter 12. But the interesting thing to me is that 
out of all of this, and it's <coughs> quite hard to understand and very, very mysterious in some ways, extremely interesting. But God always has witnesses. Remember when, when God created the nation of Israel and he called them out of Egypt at the exodus of Moses and the Red Sea was parted and they began their journey to the promised land. He said, you'll be witnesses, Exodus 19, unto me. You'll be a royal priesthood. You'll be witnesses unto me to all the Gentile nations. And they refused to do that, you remember? Yes. And the, the example of that in the prophecy of Jonah. And now we see in this uh, tribulation period, the Jewish nation is used like Jonah. They finally go back to the Gentiles to be witnesses. And the 144,000 witness and multitudes are brought to the knowledge of Jesus in the tribulation period. But the, the amazing thing is that God always has witnesses. Isaiah says, you'll be witnesses to me. And when Jesus rose from the dead and, and taught his disciples, he said, now when the Holy Spirit has come, the day of Pentecost, you will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth, the uttermost parts of the earth, you'll be witnesses. And God still is witness. And here's the lesson for us. He wants us to be his witnesses right now. He wants us to, to witness to people, to testify to people about the gospel. That was the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all people. That's our commission that he's given to us as Christians to, to be witnesses. <coughs> you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And I, I was thinking of a little story in connection with this and how God can use us as witnesses. You know, there was a, a pastor, the story is told, and it's a true story of a pastor, and he used to go out with his, his little girl, uh, his daughter, and they would give out tracts every Saturday and invite people to come to his church and give them gospel tracts. And you know I have a great tension about gospel tracts. Yeah. I yeah. Just ordered another. You know that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Another 500 of these. Quite a job trying to order them. Yeah, it's good. Yes, uh, yeah, you want some of those? Just one. Just one. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, amazing. Especially when I've been on beautiful cruises in the Caribbean yes. and Alaska and so on. Um, I've given people these tracks and quite an interesting response. And I've seen a couple of people. Nobody tried to jump overboard. <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> some people express some interest in. Through a couple of people who came to know the Lord through this. Right? Yes, interesting. Yes, yes, so yes. you can have fun and you can go on yes. a cruise and you have a wonderful holiday the Lord allows you to have and you can still be witness to Him, yes. you see? Amen. So this pastor, he, he, he would go out every Saturday uh, and he would go around and they would knock on the doors and they would give people gospel tracts, the message of the gospel. They were witnessing, you see? And inviting people to church. And one Saturday it was quite rainy. And so uh, the, uh, the pastor said to his daughter, I, I don't think we'll go out today. It's too wet. We'll, we'll just skip today, you know. The way I sometimes feel, you know, when I'm very tired on a Thursday morning, I say, well, wouldn't it be nice just to, to sleep in today? Sleep in today. Yeah. And we won't bother <laughs> going out to the And you get a little, <laughs> yeah, a little prod, a little bit of jab. <laughs> Do it, do it, do it. Be witnesses to me. Go into all the world. So this little girl said, well, Daddy, isn't it just as important to witness for Jesus today and to reach lost souls today as it is in the dry weather? And uh, he said, well, I think we'll just skip it today. She said, Daddy, if you don't want to go, will you let me go? So he said, okay, if you, if you really insist. So she went out and she knocked on a number of doors and she had one track left. And there was one house, way this kind of ghostly house. People were kind of afraid to go to it. Most yeah. people, kind of, you know, nearly every community has some house yes. like that. Eh? And uh, she had one track left, so she went and she went up this long path to this kind of scary looking house, and she knocked on the door. There was no sound, no response, and she knocked on the door again. No response, no response. She did this about four times and finally she was going to go away when the door opened and uh, here was this old lady, what do you want? And 
and uh, yeah. she, so the little girl, she could hardly refuse this little girl. The little girl said, well, I just wanted to give you some good news uh, from Lord Jesus wants me to tell you this good news and to leave this little paper with you and uh, to invite you to come to, to, to church tomorrow, to my daddy's church. And she told her where it was and so on. And the said, okay, and she slammed the door. And the little girl went away to feel kind of bad, you know, because this lady was kind of rude to her. Next day at church, <laughs> and this is, I understand, really a true story. The next day at church, her father was preaching, and at the end of the sermon, an old lady came up the center aisle, said, I just want to say something to all of you here. She said, you know, yesterday, I was about to take my life. To end my life, she said, I just did not want to live any longer, and I didn't have any hope. And she said, I didn't see any reason to live at all. And I heard a knock at the door. She said, I didn't bother answering it. But the knock came again. And I said, no, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to take my life. I was all ready to take my life. Knock came again. No, I don't think. That the knock came again. And said, well, I might as well answer it. She went to the door. <laughs> and she said, this little girl sitting up here in the front row listening to her daddy preach, that little girl handed me a gospel paper, and through that paper, I found that there was hope, a wonderful Amen. hope, Amen. and I put my trust in Jesus, and I'm here today to thank this little girl for coming to my door, be a witness, you see, in the rainy days, in the good days, in season and out of season, Paul says, Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Amen. Tell people the good news of the Lord Jesus. So you see, that's an example of how we can be witnesses. Even today, when so much in the world is against the gospel, and people often aren't interested. I know at Carrot Fest here, I think we gave out about 1,500 Gideon Testaments uh, this fall, and an Aurora about the same, and over there in Schaumburg, a little earlier in June, but you know, Many people, no, I don't want that. No, no, I'll just pass you by. I won't even acknowledge it. Keep witnessing. Keep telling people. Remember I told you that it was through a gospel tract that my father came to the Lord when he was 47 years old. And his wife was a Christian lady. You she shouldn't have married him because he wasn't a Christian at that time. He wasn't born again. 15 years before, she married him. And 11 years before that, in the year 1900, you remember she was walking down the street in Barrie and she saw lying on the sidewalk a gospel paper. Probably somebody said, no, nah, I don't want that, and threw it away. I don't know, but she picked up the, the paper and she read that paper and she read that verse. 1 Timothy 1 and 15. This is a faithful saying, a trustworthy saying, and worthy of all acceptation of everybody except me, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And you know, she just stopped right there. 20 years old, year 1900. And that's 114 years ago this year. And she said, well, I'm a sinner, and Jesus came to save the sinner. I just trusted him. She was a religious person, but she'd never been born again, never, never trusted in Jesus as her Savior, never received Him as her Savior, but she received Him right there, standing right there on the sidewalk. And then she told her family, and her family, they're all religious people, Anglican people, but, but went to church and so on, but they had never been born again. She told them, and they all trusted the Savior. I knew one of them very well, Aunt Jane T. And uh, she was almost like a second mother to me. So you see, God has witnesses. He wants us to be witnesses. He wants us to tell people of the wonderful salvation they can have through putting their trust in the Lord Jesus. How He can change their lives. He can give them hope. Give them forgiveness of sins. Give them eternal life. Give them fellowship with God and fellowship with other people who are witnesses to the saving power of the Lord Jesus. That's, yeah. a, that's our job. And, uh, 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 David's been 
sending me some wonderful emails of how in the Seventh Day Adventist Church now, and, and I think uh, Lawrence is probably involved in this too. This, the ten days of prayer. What is it? The fourth or fifth day now? And uh, no, it's past the it's, it's, it's over. Yeah, yeah, it's it's over. finished. And um, they they uh, they're encouraging people to pray. If we're going to see people saved when we tell them about the Lord Jesus, we need to pray. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers into his harvest and he'll bring a harvest in of people that have put their trust in the Lord Jesus. So that, that's our the message for today that comes out of this rather mysterious and quite amazing part of the book of Revelation concerning the, uh, the two witnesses and the the time that God is going to preserve a number of people from the tribulation. What was your aunt's name again? Aunt Jane Key, K-E-E -E was her name. That's yeah. the last name? Yeah, that was her last name. She married Uncle Sam, Samuel Key, Sam Key, Uncle Sam and Aunt Jane. 152 Indian Grove, down in the west end of Toronto. I still remember that house very well. They're close to Hyde Park there. Very uh, close to Hyde Park, yeah. yeah, very, very oh. close. Right by Keel and uh, Brewer Street, yeah, yeah. Wonderful yeah. couple, yeah. And uh, when that lady died that my father married, that, that picked up that trap, uh, they raised my my half-brother, father's son, by his first wife, the lady that was saved through that track. She died uh, four months after my father was saved through a track. And, uh, so now this lady was she your mother, the first No, she was the sister of my father's first wife, Agnes Ellis was uh, my father's wife name and, and Jane Ellis was this lady's name, Jane Key. And, uh, and then seven years later he married my mother, Florence Patterson. And so he had one son by his first wife, and he had one son happened to be agreed by his second wife, by my mother Florence, Amanda Patterson. Yeah. Just two sons. Two sons. So my half brother, uh, he uh, Douglas, Douglas Ellis McCarthy, named Ellis after his mother, surname, yeah, uh, Ellis. He had two sons. He became a chiropractor uh, in uh, Oregon. He had two sons too, rather interesting. Kevin McCarthy. You'll see his name on uh, the movies quite a bit. Well, he was, I think, named after one of the. Kevin McCarthy, the movie actor. And I noticed when I watch Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy that uh, Kevin McCarthy is uh, the director. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And created by Merv Griffin. But anyway, Kevin's the oldest son and Curtis the other. And Curtis, he's coming up, Lord willing, to, to visit us in May, May the 7th this year. So we've been down to visit them a couple of times there in Salt Lake City, Utah. They were put in the Mormon camp first, but the Mormon camp was evangelized and to a gospel preacher, and they came to know the Lord. Interesting, yeah. So the Kevin McCarthy on Wheel of Fortune is that? No, <laughs> no. I, I think I think my brother named uh, named him Kevin after the actor Kevin McCarthy. He was quite a famous actor. Yeah. Interesting how the Lord works, but He wants us to be witnesses to tell people about what Jesus has done for us. We don't have to be theologians. We don't have to be a doctor of theology like me to tell people how they can get saved through trusting in Jesus. They can have their sins forgiven. We could be just like the blind man. You remember that the Lord Jesus healed what the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the high priests and the priests, they all went after him, you know, what about this man that healed you? He can't be a, he can't be a God because he healed you on the Sabbath day. He must be a bad man. And so he says, I don't know the answers to all your questions, but I know one thing. I was blind. Now I see it. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Save the rest like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. So we can tell people. Tell people about Jesus and how they can have their sins forgiven. Come to know the Lord Jesus as their own personal Savior. No more return. Yeah. So there are great things we can learn from even the most complicated sections of the Bible. And I believe that's one of the main ones.
Jesus wants us to tell people, eh? Go and tell, go and tell the story of the Christ who died for me. Eh? So we've got lots of things to pray for at this present time. Have our Prime Minister to pray for as he comes back from Israel. Yeah. Rather interesting. There'll probably be great repercussions. Yeah, more than likely. Because there are about five times as many Muslims in Canada as there are Jews. Yeah, yeah. So everybody won't appreciate what he's done. No. He just stood for that country. And rather interesting, the Bible says that God told Abraham those who blessed his people, he, God would bless. And those who cursed him, he would curse. Canada, I believe, has been blessed because they've stood with Israel. Yep. Yeah. Every country that has stood with Israel has been blessed. Uh, so that's another aspect of prophecy that's interesting.